Thanks, everyone, for coming. So this session is on um, software productivity and AI. So I have to apologize for the confusion. Um, there was a session before this that was uh, software, uh, software for AI developers, and this is AI for software developers. And I think that was where the, I think they got the wrong title, and we got a different title. Um, so hopefully you're in the right class. Uh, <clears throat> so I also want to introduce uh, the three panelists. Uh, they are here. Um, Margaret Ann Story from University of Victoria, and Prem Kumar Devanbu from UC Davis, and also Amadasan from Queen's University uh, in Canada. So um, welcome, everyone. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to the area and also some of the stuff that we are doing at Microsoft uh, that's related to this, and then open it up to the panel to discuss further and uh, take it from there. And given it's a small crowd, we'll kind of improvise as we go um, in terms of uh, how we allow the use of the time. So first thing we want to talk about, what do software developers look like today? So you know, if you want to predict the future of uh, the AI workforce. So there's been a ton of study on um, data scientists and data science and what data scientists should do and how do engineers become data scientists, how do data scientists become engineers, et cetera. And you know, there was a, a LexisNexis did a study saying it, there's going to be 20 exabytes of data by 2020, which means we need a lot of engineers to process that data, and uh, how are we going to hire those engineers? Which uh, then IBM released some numbers saying that we're going to require 2.72 million people, uh, so data scientists by the year 2020. Um, and then, uh, McKinsey released some data saying that the demand for data scientists is so much that we're going to be 50% short, and we're going to be really short of data scientists by the year 2020. And then they released a later number, which basically said AI technology and tools evolve, and skill sets of data scientists will be rendered useless in 12 to 18 months. And we see that, you know, people come knowing R and some standard programming models, and by the time, you know, I have turned over probably three rounds of data scientists in the last four years, because either they pick up new skills or they don't, right? So, um, so it, is, it is a challenge. And then, finally, um, Katie Nuggets did a survey and, uh, of uh, ML engineers and said 51% of them feel that they will be out of a job by the year 2025 because they will be replaced by AI software that can write code itself, and they're not going to have jobs anymore. So the whole data science, uh, engineering, AI, a space is in, in a flux. It, the definition is not very clear, what kind of people we should hire, you know, what the future of that looks like, et cetera. And it's a challenge for people like us who hire uh, engineers or scientists and the kind of problems we throw at them. So hopefully through this discussion, I'm, uh, we, we can get through to some of the interesting uh, topics related to this area. So I want to start with the story of uh, uh, oh, actually, uh, I wanted to say something about Software 2.0. Actually, the fourth panelist was supposed to be Andres Karpati, who came up with this notion of Software 2.0. And his premise is that large portion of the code, you know, real-world problems have the property that, you know, you cannot write algorithms for it. You cannot write code for it. They will have input, and they will have output, and they will have patterns. So you actually can build a model and replace code with models. So his idea, at least from the space that he's working in, he works at Tesla, and a lot of this is, hey, how do I make the car automatically park? Or when do the windshield wipers go off automatically? There's no logic for it. Or if, the, if you write, try to log write logic for it, it's very complicated. So instead of that, if I gather enough data on the input side, and then I build a model, and then produce output that actually works, and learns from the output, and goes back into the input, and kind of do a reinforcement kind of learning stuff, then actually I don't have to write code. All I have to do is replace what I would have done here with kind of a giant neural network, uh, which I need to train and deploy. And all it is doing is finding the right kind of code in the program space. This is directly borrowed from his blog, um, which will basically um, you know, find the right kind of algorithm buried somewhere in this space, rather than writing that piece of code that I have to write, which has very complex logic. The nice thing about this idea is that you know, it, it, it is self-healing and it's self-correcting, but it, it's, it solves certain kinds of problems very, very well. So if you talk to um, Johannes Gerke, who is a, a fellow at Microsoft, I think he has a keynote uh, later today, he might talk about it. They have replaced big chunks of code in Skype and Teams with this kind of a model, where they replace thousands of lines of code with just a few lines of model, where um, you know, the, uh, the system is much more compact and performs more efficiently. Um, 
And my own journey as a software engineer started uh, when, I, when I graduated from college, I was trying to figure out, I, I, I did a thesis on compiler compilers, and I mean, this was back in India, and we had to type our uh, uh, dissertation, and it actually had to give it to a real typist. Um, that was the requirement of the university. And the typist came back to me and said, you have one too many compilers in your, in your, and he removed one compiler. So wherever it said compiler, compiler, he just wrote the word compiler and completely described my dissertation. And you know, it was based upon this paper, literally written 40 years ago by uh, Cattell, um, basically on code generator generators. So CMU was doing a ton of work on, instead of, you got M languages and N machines, and you would write, code, uh, write a code generator for a particular language to a particular machine, you cannot be writing, you'll be writing M times N compilers instead of writing M times N compilers. How do you reduce that to M plus N compilers? So they have this idea of code generator generators. And this was kind of the paper I read much later than it was published, but you know, that was before the internet and, um, and I was in India. And so you know how long it takes to get that paper out there. But if this paper was published today, you know, what would it say? A automatically generates code that run on any machine, right? Uh, because that's what you would say today. But I mean, there is some truth to it as well. So uh, when, I, when I started as an intern, it was a, a research center back in India. And um, you know, uh, we, they hired top graduates from the top universities in India to do program translations. A lot of the code that you write in computer science at that time was translating code in one language to another language. So pro writing pro program translators. And you did it in a human way. So. Um, Companies like Hewlett Packard or IBM would have software written in one language like COBOL, you need to translate it to PL1, or you have something that is written in Modula, need to translate that to C or C++. What would they do? They give these transformation rules to these engineers who would have this card on their side and they will actually go edit the code and say, oh, I see an if, left brace, right brace, I'll change it to if condition, begin, end. I mean, that they physically did that. So, a lot of the problems we did was of this nature. You got a program in one language, and you need to translate a program in another language, and uh, you, know, you need to write a code generator. You wrote this code generator by hand. But you, know, you don't need, really need to write this code generator. My mentor at that time told me that you know, programmers should get paid well, but people who generate programs should get paid 10 times as much. So you don't write programs, you generate programs. So that was kind of the idea. And so what you did was you got a grammar in one language, a source language, and you grammar in a target language, and then you write a code generator generator that translates the code from, uh, uh, that pertains to one grammar, and that satisfies the other grammar. So you wrote a lot of rules. And if you didn't have the grammar, then you had examples. So you took examples of code in one grammar, and then you wrote rules to map them to examples of code in another, another grammar. And then you, know, you, you got your code generator generator, which will generate a code generator, which will translate programs from one language to another. And you could further improve that by kind of saying, hey, I don't want to do M by N code generator generator, so I have an intermediate representation, a standard kernel that goes between different grammars. And so that way, I have a retargetable code generator generator. So I can reduce everything to an intermediate form, and I can do it. So all of my early programming went in writing tree transformers. So we, were, we would be writing tree transformation rules. We would be writing tree algorithms, efficient tree algorithms. So okay, program a tree, you navigate the tree efficiently, and you write this, make these transformers run really, really fast. So um, I spent a lot of time doing that. And the nice thing about it was, so I can, I can quote one project where the company I was interning at, where I got paid $200 for six months, uh, of course, translated to Indian rupees. Um, they had coded 100 man years, um, that, they, they, that's how we used to code projects, 100 man years to translate everything written in Modula to Unix and C, because they're going to hire 100 people to manually change the code, millions of lines of code. What I did was I actually wrote a, 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 a code generator, uh, generator system, which will generate uh, trees in one language and translate it to trees in another language that was done in about two months' time. And, uh, the way they priced it was they charged $80,000 for writing the translator generator and charged 25 cents for each line that was translated, and about 3 million lines of code was translated automatically. Right? So this was way before AI, but at the same time, I had the satisfaction of being a part of that project. Of course, I got paid, as I said, $500 for doing that. Um, 
But those are efficient systems. If I were to do that today, what would I do? I cover all of this part. I have a lot more data than before, um, right? So all of this stuff have examples of source code in one language, examples of so, uh, uh, code in another language. I'll build this giant AI model that will learn from these examples and build a transformation model and automatically give my program translator. So that's kind of the stuff that we do today, right? So. Um, in fact, if you look at NL, uh, natural language processing, there's a ton of uh, progress that has been made in the program language community. We are trying to learn from that, and we are trying to apply that. So uh, the recent uh, MIT uh, Technology Review has a great article on how uh, researchers have been able to translate between uh, language, very rare languages, languages for which there is very little data, and how they are mapped into other languages, because maybe the past tense in the language or the verb in the language or the, the combination of verb and noun in the language are mapped a certain way across the languages and you can get an automatic translator. And this is, this is really exciting for us because we can learn from these things which is done for natural language and can apply to programming languages. So, um, so it's really a good time to be an engineer writing compiler systems. We don't go find people writing compilers anymore, but at the same time, you can do much more than just writing standard compilers uh, doing this kind of stuff. With that, I want to switch gears a little bit and say, what do we do at Microsoft? So uh, I see some of my colleagues here, uh, some PMs, and they're very familiar with these pictures. So when we think about our developers, right, uh, we think about what we call inner loop and outer loop. So a typical developer has an inner loop, edits the code, uh, builds it, debugs it. So that's kind of the inner loop experience. And uh, I'm not sure if that, that terminology goes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, can I just add something though? It seems like compilers are the one place where, like, oh, it seems, it seems like, uh, this is Tomball. Um, I mean, uh, compilers, yay, uh, because that's how I cut my teeth too. But it seems like that's the one area that we actually don't have, um, we don't have AI replacing compiler writers yet. But you're saying, but you're worrying me. Well, let's talk so, about so, it. so that it's not actually happened. I mean, I haven't seen it, or maybe I'm unaware. But um, I mean, I, I sort of agree that you know it's within the scope. It's a language. It's got a grammar. There are semantic rules. Mm -hmm. But somehow, like the correctness criteria for uh, it's much more precise and unambiguous than that's, say that's a, that's natural a, language. So I sort of sort of wonder. I'm a little scared by the talk so far. But I'm also like, we don't have evidence yet, do we? We yeah. don't have evidence yet, but at the same time, you're up for the challenge. So, oh, so no, the, no, 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 I'm, so I'm the, with you, but, yeah. but I'm just saying like, um, like that still remains, like we have all these amazing examples, like you said, for natural language, but it's been actually pretty tough going. Um, I, we haven't seen like huge progress in synthesis, really. I mean, the synthesis has been mainly for small programs and, and, and translation between languages is still because of the semantic, um, precision and sort of small differences. There's lots of corner cases and stuff. So I'm not saying it won't happen, but it, I don't think it's happened yet. Right. So we are, we're taking small steps. So today we are saying, that's why I put up this picture. We're taking very, very small steps here. So the smallest step is to say, hey, you're writing code. Can I help you write code, right? Um, that's where we start. Now, the, the big picture, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it as we go. We're not there yet. And, and you're right that if, if yeah, I'm translating from, say, so I have friends who are Chinese on Facebook. They, they, um, one of my friends says all his friends are Chinese except for me, and they talk in Chinese. I take their text, put it to Google Translate, um, and then what I want to write in English, I, trans I turn that to Chinese and translate it on Google and put it, paste it back on Facebook. And they understand what I say. I'm, you know, nine out of 10 words might be correct there. They laugh at me once in a while, but at the same time, they get the answer. Now, if I feed that to a computer, it's going to just barf, right? It's, it's not going to work because, you know, if you have a program, that's all, there is no program that's almost correct, right? It has to be correct or it's got to be wrong. So you're right there. But at the same time, you know, we can, uh, we can do stuff that actually improves the developer productivity, helps, helps the developer write 80% of the code in efficient ways, and then put the human do the remaining hard 20%. So a lot of this automation is about doing the easy ones really well, uh, through the machine and give the hard ones to the human being so that they, they actually do it, do it in the human way, right? So that's, that's kind of the idea. Um, but we have to push the limits of it to see how far we can go, right? And, and come back, coming back to this point, so that's kind of the inner loop of development, and I'll give you a couple of examples. If uh, Mark and Sheng Yu are here, they must, you must have seen their demo on IntelliSense on how we help developers uh, write, complete their code. 
And in the outer loop, you have code reviews and testing and continuous integration, CI, CD stuff, release management, issue reporting, documentation, production, analytics. All of this come with a ton of data, and we can use AI in every step of the way here to improve uh, the productivity of the developer or the, uh, or the teams to do things automatically. And when I say automatically, I say do the mundane things automatically and have the human beings do the intelligent things. So there is a ton of stuff that can be done automatically. Um, and uh, today, for example, uh, one, of the, one of my team members had done a, an analysis of code review, PR reviews. And he found that 60% of PR reviews are stylistic. Um, says, hey, you need a tab here, you need a space here, you need to capitalize your uh, variable name, uh, you should have more meaningful variable names. It's almost like somebody doing a paper review the night before the reviews are due, due right? So the, the, the conference chairs expect you to write a page full of review, and if you see that 80% of that is all typos and, and, and spelling corrections and stylistic stuff, really doesn't talk about the details. And that's kind of, you know, engineers are forced to do uh, PR reviews, and they're saying, oh, these are easy things I can say about the code, and I will say it, and that way I'm out of my, you know, I'm, I've done with my job. So that can be easily automated, and we are trying to automate that kind of stuff. So then there is, when there is hard code reviews, then maybe there's a human expert that's required, right? Um, so for, for uh, coming back to the point of helping the user develop code, so we have taken a very, very systematic approach to helping developers write code. So today, when, when we started doing this, we said, well, you know, about 60% of what you write are API calls. Today, especially people doing a lot of AI code, a lot of systems code, you're, you have a library you import, and then you make an API call. So when you, when you call a class, uh, an object of a class, or make a class and a method call, can I predict the method that you're going to call? Right, that's the first step. And if I can help you with that, I significantly improve your productivity. Right, and to do that, now we have to make that a part of an editor, so that's Visual Studio, VS Code, whatever that is, and we have to make it efficient in the sense that we are not interfering with the developer's experience. So we have to make sure that it delivers the model in a compact way so that it can sit, you know, not take up enough memory on the client, and also the model comes back, the inference is so fast that you know, it's not interfering with the user experience. So today we have a very, very simple model uh, you must have seen the demo in the morning, so I'm not going to show the demo. It basically understands all of the program flow you have, the control flow, you know, things inside if conditions, things inside while loops, uh, defined before use, et cetera, et cetera. Takes advantage of that and builds a very nicely engineered machine learning model and, and works very well. You know, it, it, use, it uses less than 30 megabytes of space and comes back with a recommendation within 15 milliseconds. That's perfect. But it, if you want make, to make it do more things, so for example, if you want to predict what argument you're going to use when you make a method call, especially when you have overloaded methods, right? Now you start to, start to push the limits of what this can do. So you need something more than that. And if you look at code, code is kind of like text, right? So which means it's a sequence. So you go left to right, you know, things that you say in the left, um, uh, uh, things, that, things that you have in the right are kind of dependent on things that are in the left. So it is kind of a sequence, a sequence model, very much like human text. So we have a model that uh, is basically an LSTM-based model with attention. Now this performs significantly better than the, uh, the regular classification model that we have, but at the same time it has other challenges. Right? Number one, it is not transparent. I'm not able to explain when it makes a recommendation what recommendation it is making. It is kind of an abstruse model because it's building stuff inside the thing that it's not able to explain. So explainability is not there, but at the same time it gives me a lot more ac accuracy. Now if I throw a lot more data at it, um, and a lot more code at it, then I can build a very, very complex model. I can use something like a GPT-2 or a BERT model or, or um, um, XLNet, and I can understand a whole lot of things about your code. Not only I understand about code in one language like Python or Java, I can, I, um, I can mix them up because almost all of the code, all of the languages have you know, the notion of a variable, notion of assignment, notion of, you know, definition, use, et cetera, et cetera, and I can just mix them all up and learn the structure of your code, learn the syntax of your code, learn the semantics of your code. So one of the things that happened when we built this model on the left was that when we built a model for C-sharp and Java, right, we have a type system. So we could hang off of the type system when you're making a method call. We could say, oh, um, this is of this type, so only these method calls will apply. But when you're working with languages like Python, which are loosely typed or no type at all, we have to figure out what the type might be. We have to create approximations for the type. So all of it had to be engineered. But when you have a model that's as complex as this, which uses a lot of data, 
we don't have to worry about the text because we're learning from patterns of the code. And today we have a model that works reasonably well and it can actually, it doesn't care whether it's a function call or whether it's an argument, it can finish lines of code for you. It can do a lot more because, it, and the nice thing about throwing everything uh, into it is that it knows that the left parenthesis has to be matched by life, right parenthesis after four arguments, just because it has so many examples of use of that. So that's the beauty of it. So uh, going back to Tom's point, can, can we do that? We are not there yet, but I think we are getting there. And there's an opportunity to get there. So we can be, you know, these, are, these come back with about 90, 92% accuracy. Um, so given enough resources, given enough code, enough, given enough complexity of, uh, of your algorithms, I think you can do that. So that's, that's, um, uh, that's, what, I, that's what I think um, we can do. So what do we need to achieve all of these things? So first thing is data, right? For us, in terms of code, we have tons of data. Um, if you look at GitHub, you know, you got more than 100 million repos. We've got, you know, um, uh, 30 plus million contributors. You've got 200 million pull requests. So there's a tons of data over there, 50 plus languages of code. And you can, you have access to all of this stuff. And you can, you got English text, French text, German text. You've got uh, code in 50 different languages. And you can do it, a lot of stuff with that. Uh, similarly, if you have Stack Overflow, you got six plus million users, 12 plus million questions and answers. So when, when you, somebody asks a question, the answer comes with code related to it. So now we can combine human text, English text, along with code, right? And you got corporate data. So if I were Microsoft, we got millions of lights, the lines of code only in one piece of software like uh, uh, Windows. So we can do something that's very specific to Microsoft, inside Microsoft, um, and to build this intelligence. So basically we have tons of data and we can take advantage of it. Now to go with this data, you know, we have to have analytics. So one thing we were very careful about was we didn't throw a model at it first. We uh, analyzed uh, the, the code deeply before we threw a model at it. So for example, there are some classes that are used all the time. Um, there's some classes that are rarely used. So if you want a high accuracy model, you focus on things that are used more commonly, patterns that occur more commonly, and you can have a simpler model. So uh, learning code, for example, here back in 71, Donald Knud looked at 18, 800 Fortran programs and said 95% of the loops are actually, you have only one line inside of them. Right, if you have this kind of information, you can f feed a machine this information and build super efficient model. And actually, more recently, some of my colleagues in MSR, they did analysis of 25 million lines of code and came up with almost the same answer, um, which is amazing, I think. So some things have not changed uh, over years, right? And we can use that to kind of do EDM mining and stuff like that, right? So anyway, then we have a, AI has made significant progress. We, we started with sim very simple models, but today we have you know, RNNs and LSTMs we can use for code and, uh, you know, uh, to do the kind of stuff that we are doing. Um, and we are borrowing a ton of stuff from NLP and computer vision. So, uh, and we have also tons of tools like AutoML and PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, and then we are also, as we mine code, we are being careful that we are not violating people's privacy, et cetera. So we got a ton of tools for us to build good algorithms around. Right? And in terms of system, we have you know, uh, uh, a lot of GPUs available. You know, GPUs are by default in most of the computers today. And you know, we have much faster interconnects than we had before. And we can actually take borrow ideas from HPC. Now, how do we overlap computation with communication? Right? Um, how do we do reduction in an efficient way? Uh, how do we combine you know, data parallelism with kind of model parallelism, stuff like that. So we, we borrow techniques from there and we can combine all of these things and put them together and actually build systems that actually work, right? So, and finally there are humans in the loop which we should not forget because uh, one of the things we found when we deployed our models was uh, our offline, the first model, our offline accuracy was uh, in the 70% and we deployed it, our PMs went and did a, a survey of our customers and the customers were quite happy. And usually, I mean, anybody who's done machine learning who, who does an offline accuracy of 70% when they deploy it online, they, it that just doesn't work. So we did something right. And one of the things we learned was because we, we did the user experience was perfect, right? We iterated a lot on the user experience to make sure that the models don't interfere with the user's flow, user's thinking flow or the, or the code writing flow. And we made sure that happened because the users don't care there is AI underneath. All the users care is that you're helping them be more efficient and more productive, right? So basically, um, 
my summary is, you know, there are four, four things that you require if you want to build AI-infused software. So one thing is, you know, you know, programming languages and compiler systems. The second is algorithms I talked about, so uh, good use of data and AI. And, you know, uh, methods from high-performance computing um, that we have to use to build large-scale models. And finally, you know, uh, uh, user experience, which is really, really important. A model that's good enough provides great user experience is much better than a model that's perfect, kind of interferes with the users. So this is our learning from some of the automation that we have done uh, to improve user productivity. And uh, I call upon um, the panelists to kind of touch upon some of these topics in their own experience, and then we can have a discussion. So we'll start with... Um, uh, Peggy uh, uh, from University of Victoria. She has done a ton of work related to uh, user interaction in software productivity. And uh, Peggy, take it away. Thanks. And while she sets up, if you have any questions, comments, please. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I can sit. Um, questions or comments for Neil? Can you hear me okay? Okay, so that was uh, the PowerPoint AI at work there. You see the way it was zoomed in on my nose? Okay. <laughs> I think, right? And uh, if, the, if the AI was really smart, it would have known that uh, Peggy is a synonym for Margaret <laughs> um, and switch that in too, probably. So you're finding my slides here. So you remember you saw the four circles that he had there and the human-computer interaction was the bottom one. So that's the one that I'm going to talk about uh, just a little bit here. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to talk about why humans and AI need to join forces in software development. So I am a professor at the University of Victoria, which is a short plane ride if the plane is uh, not cancelled <laughs> away uh, up in Victoria, just across the strait here. And uh, I'm also, um, I work uh, quite a bit. I did some sabbatical and I'm still doing collaboration with the 1ES team here at Microsoft and also working with guys over in Microsoft Software Research. So a lot of the stuff that I've been doing is looking at productivity at Microsoft. So I'll talk about that during my talk here today. And um, first of all, I want to talk about uh, conceptualizing productivity and what do we mean by productivity. So how do you even define what it is? How do you, if you can't really define it, then how do you measure it? How do you come with the metric? How do you know that the AI system that you're building is actually going to make a difference if you can't really define what productivity is? So um, a bunch of us from uh, research and also some industry partners we met in Dogstool a couple of years ago now, and we talked about productivity for a week. And then we wrote a book, and this is the book that came out of it, Rethinking Productivity in Software Engineering. It's written more with uh, practitioners in mind. And I was co-author on one of the chapters called Conceptualizing, or actually it was called A Software Development Productivity Framework. And the goal of this chapter was to conceptualize uh, productivity. And we came up with this framework, these three different ways that you can think about productivity. So on the one hand, you can think about the velocity of the work. And on another hand, you can think about, three hands now, sorry about that. Um, another way you can think about the quality, so that it's say uh, the number of bugs in the system when you deploy it. And then finally, you can think about uh, productivity in terms of developer satisfaction. So developer satisfaction is often used as a proxy for perceived productivity on the part of the developer because developers do a lot of things during the day, right? They don't just write code. Right, or test it, they also review it, they help other people, they, um, they write test cases, they go to meetings, they design, they look at requirements and so on. So looking at their perceived productivity is a good way to measure productivity as well. And while I was at Microsoft uh, two years ago and during the past year and a half as well, we've been looking at trying to understand how to measure perceived productivity on the part of developers. And out of that research, so we did a lot of observations and we interviewed different people from different groups at Microsoft. And that led to a big survey through which we have this initial kind of theory about how developer satisfaction and their perceived productivity uh, match to each other. And there is this bi-directional relationship between their satisfaction with their job and also their perceived productivity. And we build on theories from, uh, the, from uh, management, actually, that looked at and saw that there was this bi-directional relationship. So basically what that means is if you feel more satisfied at work, you're going to feel more perceived product, uh, productive. And if you feel more productive, then you're going to feel more satisfied. 
So the purpose of this research, though, was to identify what are the other factors, both social and technical factors, that might influence how developers feel about their jobs and about their productivity. Is this still working? Is it good? Yeah, good. Um, and so what we did was we did this survey to identify these factors, to also understand how satisfied developers were with these factors, and then we built a regression model to try to understand which ones actually can explain their overall satisfaction and their productivity. And let me look at the challenges first. So the other thing that we found through this survey and the work that we did is that there's a lot of challenges that developers say influence or impact negatively their satisfaction and their productivity. And, and we expected that we would see sort of a one-to-one -one relationship with challenges and then the factors in our model that would sort of impact their overall satisfaction and perceived productivity, but we didn't. And so what you see is that some challenges just have this knock-on effect. So for example, if you report uh, that, your, that your manager has a big impact on your ability to work, that is going to then lead to lower satisfaction across 16 other measures. And the same with team culture. If you feel that the culture of your team is not good, it's going to have a knock-on effect with nine other factors, which then in turn will impact the satisfaction and the perceived productivity of the developers. And so this uh, uh, diagram here shows that first theory that I showed you at the beginning, which was kind of the high-level theory relating the factors to overall job satisfaction and perceived productivity. And after we ran the survey with, um, I think we heard from about 470 developers, we then created this, uh, this regression model, which then allowed us to tease out which are the actual factors that help explain their, their satisfaction and which factors help explain their perceived productivity. And just a couple of things to note uh, here. One is that in the terms of the key factors that influence their perceived productivity, you see that there are many different factors that play a role there. Um, sure, engineering tools is one of them, and that's where AI fits in, right? But there are also all of these other factors as, as well. And then on the satisfaction side, we see that work culture, and under work culture, we clustered team culture, organization culture, as well as their manager and how collaborative their team were. Um, we see that, that actually this woman ha um, had the most explanatory power in terms of how they um, felt about, how satisfied they felt about their jobs. And so when we look at this and when we look at other research, we do know that software development is a team sport, right? So a lot of the focus that I'm seeing so far coming out about AI and how AI can change software engineering and change software development is very much focused around the individual developer and how to help the individual developer. And so what I'm trying to do through this short talk and maybe provoke some discussion afterwards is thinking about can we shift and think about how AI could help collaboration and help the team be more productive. And, and this is a, a picture to just kind of demonstrate this. So on the one hand, if we focus too much on the technical aspects, so we may have this great AI that does a really good job of producing, say, more warnings. I'll pick on Brendan's favorite example here. Maybe more uh, security warnings, right? And so we have this AI that shows there are all these security warnings and, and developers should address them, right, before um, shipping the code. If you just do that and don't think about the developers and how they're going to um, sort of deal with those, then you may hit some problems because a lot of engineers will go, I'm not going to fix those bugs, right? I'm just going to suppress the warnings or maybe I'm going to you know, hide them somehow from my manager and then carry on. Um, on, on the other hand then, if you, if you spend too much time just looking at the, the humans in the loop and you forget or you don't look at what are the, the technical opportunities that you might have at hand, then you also don't do as well as you could. So it really is this sweet spot here in the middle, um, that socio-technical intersection that if you pay attention to both the, te the technical side and the, so and the human and social side, that you really will get those gains right, in terms of the productivity. So I'm really calling for this joint optimization of both. So how can AI boost uh, developer productivity? So if we look just on the individual side, we see a lot of examples of how AI can automate tasks, particularly rote tasks, and basically just kind of remove them right from the de developer's uh, work that they have to do. 
or we may see some AI that provides cognitive support. So it doesn't completely automate the task, but it amplifies their cognition in somehow, some way. Maybe it gives them a list of recommendations. Maybe it's, it you know, removes the, the, um, the need for the engineer to keep track of a list of things, and it does that for them, right? Or it does some calculations. Or maybe the AI will just provide some information about system attributes, about quality of the system, or again, recommendations. Um, or maybe it provides some p feedback on personal productivity. So the AI can be watching what the engineer, the developer is doing, and then give them feedback on terms of their own productivity. Um, with the team level, in terms of understanding how teams work, now we have to start taking into consideration how developers and other stakeholders on the project, how they communicate with each other, how they coordinate their work, how they collaborate on the projects that they have to collaborate on, and also, can the AI also give them awareness of how they're collaborating with others, and even help them reflect on their collaborative aspects. So how does AI do that? So um, Neil actually gave a pretty good overview of some of the possibilities, particularly in the inner and the outer loop and the different levels and the different ways that AI can be used. And we're going to hear more actually from Prem and Ahmed on that. Um, but how, how is that AI, that magical information, how is that, um, how is that communicated to the developers? What does that look like? Well, it may look like um, a prompt, it may look like a pop-up box, it may be a list of things that you might want to choose from, a, a set of search results, or, you know, or it may be just something that's done automatically and the, the developer and engineer doesn't even have to touch it. But often AI has to be fed through, through a user interface, and often dashboards are used um, for doing that at the individual and team level. So looking at uh, telemetry data and running AI and telemetry data, that is then brought to individual developer and stakeholders' hands so that they can look at that information in the dashboards. Um, there's not actually a lot of research, though, on how these dashboards are used or how they're designed. So there's a lack of research on how that's done. And I'm not going to talk about that a lot today, but we did write a short um, book chapter in that other book that I told you from, from the Dagstuhl workshop. And I'll touch on that a little bit later on. And then another way that we're seeing AI uh, sort of making its way into the hands of developers and in, into the interplay between uh, developers working together is through bots, through these virtual team members. And I do want to talk about these for a few minutes. So what are bots? So this is a definition that my student came up with for her thesis. So software bots are interfaces that connect users with software services. Um, we've seen a lot of bots over the last few days, depending on the breakout sessions that you went to. And so basically, a bot is this interface that may provide access to either integrated services you know, or uh, calculations or algorithms within the bot itself or it may actually connect to external services and access through an API. And the bot brings those services to the user to use directly. Now, of course, they also bring additional value in terms of the AI or the intelligence that's in them, but they may also bring value by the way that they are, have a personality, the way that the bots work with the developers, right? Um, and I'll talk about that next a little bit. In development, in software development, we're seeing a lot of different bots propping up. Um, so we see bots while well, Neil was talking about uh, some of the ways of uh, uh, synthesizing code. So we're seeing software bots as well, providing a way to create that code. We see test bots that are working together in the team of developers and detecting bugs and detecting code quality issues and then feeding information back to the developers, um, perhaps in their Teams channel or in a Slack channel and telling them there are these issues. Or the bots may even automatically open up bugs in GitHub and assign them to particular developers depending on which part of the code they find the, co the problem in. There's also DevOps uh, bots that automate deployment and operation and run the things that were manually done before and then send messages or communicate with the developers again through these platforms, these communication chat platforms. There are code review bots, so we were talking about those yesterday, that might recommend changes. Often they're pretty simple changes based on the code, um, sort of things like um, syntax, not syntax issues, but naming issues. Um, 
Code review bots may also recommend reviewers. Um, they may, well, there are also bots that support inter interaction with product users. So a lot of companies are using bots um, to actually directly talk to the users of their software so that they don't have to have uh, engineer time doing that. There are documentation bots that produce docs from developers' artifacts and translate them from one language to another. There are also, interestingly, a lot of entertainment bots. So we heard in one of the keynotes the other day, if you want to be productive, it's good to also have fun and it's good to take a break. So when we were studying how developers use bots, we found a lot of these and we kind of chuckled, but probably serves a good, a good role, right? Um, and whenever I teach and I use bots in the, the stuff that I'm teaching, my students always ask, can we have Giphy, please? You know, it's important um, that they have these fun things. And this last one is sort of one that I'm I don't see a lot of this, but we're starting to see it, and I think we could in the future. We could have sort of researcher bots that could study individual and team productivity. Um, so that's something that I think we'll start to see more of. Um, there's also this notion of uh, chat ops um, instead of dev ops, um, where uh, the chat ops is kind of dev ops with this bot that also chats with the different people in the collaboration. Um, and I love this quote. So chat ops is a collaboration model that connects people, tools, processes, and automation into a transparent workflow. And this is pretty important because the, the bot is not just doing things in the background. So it's more than just doing scripts, but it's actually communicating through the, the messaging platform with the, the other developers that they have issued this command and other developers will see that those commands have been issued. And so that increases the level of transparency, but also increases um, the way that developers learn how to do DevOps themselves. And this is just one, I just wanted to share with you, this was one study we did with a local uh, startup company in Victoria. And a lot of startups are relying on bots. Why do you think that is? Any guesses? Pardon? It's cheaper than humans. They want to automate as much as they can. So they're very, very clever at figuring out which different human roles they can automate with bots to make, you know, make everything much more efficient. Um, and so talking to them, they even had a bot, I didn't put it on this list, that answered the doorbell. So when you rang the doorbell, um, they would get a message in Slack that somebody was at the door and they'd see a little picture of whoever was there and that was cheaper than hiring somebody to open their door, right? So they, they had bots that basically connected all of the different things that they needed to do in their product, including you know, um, notifying team members when errors and exceptions occur. They had bots that inter interacted with their end users. Um, Many, they even had bots for linking their text and phone, and so everything that they were doing was connected and came through uh, the same kind of platform. So, um, so normally I'm sailing at this time of year, <laughs> and the summit is always in the middle of when I'm supposed to be sailing, and I was uh, complaining to a couple of people last week in Slack that, um, that you know, I, I'd rather be sailing than preparing a talk for today. And so I thought, I know, I'll prepare a talk about sailing <laughs> instead of <laughs> this other thing. So I'm actually going to talk about how bots and how AI, or actually how AI really, and how data analytics helps sailing. Um, and how maybe we could learn or take some lessons, take some analogies from that, and maybe how we could apply it to software development teams. So how many people here are familiar with the America's Cup? A few people. Okay, so for those that are not, the America's Cup is probably sort of the most prestigious uh, sailing race um, in the world. Uh, it's been around since about the 1850s. And uh, America, the US, actually held on to the cup for 132 years. And uh, it's now this very contentious race where you know what, there's only one winner. Um, there's a quote, I think, from the first race where Queen Victoria was watching the race and um, uh, somebody came in first and uh, the America came in first and she said well who's going to be second and they and somebody said to her your highness there is no second <laughs> there is only first and so this race is like really intense and countries and syndicates now put a lot of money into building uh, these boats um, they used to be 12 meters for most of the race and lately they have become these catamarans that are like up to I think in 2017, they were 72 feet long. And the boats cost 10 million or more upwards. 
And the reason I'm talking about it, not because I wish I was on a boat right now, but um, is because we can learn a lot about how they use data analytics and how they use that in this team approach to winning the America's Cup. So when I was looking at this, I found some articles, and I'm sharing just some of those with you here, and I'm hoping we can kind of discuss some of these lessons and see how we could apply them. So there are several ways that America's Cup champions say, sail like successful IT teams, and I'm pulling out some of these ways or some of these analogies from this article here. So the first one is management is important, but building the complete team is mission, mission critical. So we saw this a little bit on my survey, right, that the manager uh, uh, factor was very important in terms of perceived productivity, um, but the team was as well. And so this, we see this here in sailing. And this article talks a lot about rethinking who is on the team. So you might imagine that if you look at a team on an America's Cup boat, that the team refers to the sailors, right, that are on the team. But it's not just the sailors. It's everybody else around it. It's the engineers. It's the training team. And in fact, you know, you might even say America's Cup can be sometimes won or lost before they even launch the boat that's going to race because so much engineering goes into it. Um, but I also want to put out there that we can think about these bots that are really a user interface to the AI that we're trying to build, right, for developers to use, that we can think of those also as virtual team members. So this AI that we're building or could build can become like a virtual team member in the team. So that's just one way. The second way that they talk about is that winning teams embrace disruption. So the America's Cup teams, over the years, if they didn't sort of spy on what the other uh, teams were doing and see the new technology that they were using, that they would lose, right? They just would not be able to keep up. And the engineering systems team needs to respond at the speed of opportunity in, in the preparation for these races. So the more recent uh, America Cups um, boats, and I don't know if you can see this in this picture, but they actually, um, they, they're more like they're flying than sailing because they have this technology. The New Zealand team uh, did this first. You know, they had this, this, this insight that if they built this, what they call a foil or between the two, um, the two hulls of the catamaran, that they would get lift, right, from the water. And as they reach, as they go over 18 knots, the boat lifts up and it literally flies over the water. And they can get, you know, going like just crazy speeds, like over 60 kilometers an hour, um, or even maybe it's miles an hour. And so the boats, when as, as soon as somebody comes with something, you have, they have to jump at this speed of opportunity to really be able to work that effectively. So what disruptions have we seen in software development? So Neil touched on a few. What other big disruptions do you think we've seen in software engineering? And I look at the people who are, have been around a bit longer. I can help you out if you want. Yeah, the whole continuous deployment. And what about, what, what enabled that? Automation. Yeah, automation, the cloud, right? The internet, right? Email. Recent yeah. containerization. Containerization, right? So these disruptions are changing the game, right? They're changing the, the speed at which we can deploy. And, you know, another one that I wanted to just touch on a little bit um, is the use of social technologies and the use of the cloud and how developers communicate with each other. So I'm referring here to some studies that I did that looked at how developers, particularly in open source, no longer sort of, you know, sit in their room and write their own code, but they actually are part of a big community and they learn and they help other people. And so you have this, what's called a participatory culture of software development. So a lot of my friends that are not software engineers will say, you know, software de developers, they're so antisocial. They don't talk to other developers. They just sit in the basement. And I'm like, no, not today. Developers have to be very social. And they have to know how to use these tools and how to use something like Stack Overflow. So imagine not having Stack Overflow today. So this is another example of a disruption. And I don't think that we were really aware that it was happening while it was happening. It was just something that caught a lot of people off guard and we had to just kind of rush to keep up. So I think with AI that we're gonna have, what kind of culture is AI gonna lead to in teams, right? Um, so I, I don't know, but I think it's something we need to think about. Okay, so going back to the sailing analogies, this, is, this one is, um, it's all about the data. So in this uh, America's Cup team, so I'm referring back here, um, I think this was from the 2013 team, 
the, their boat had a thousand IoT sensors on the boat. And they were producing something like 10 gigabytes of data an hour when they were sailing. Pretty incredible. That foil that I talked about had 300 sensors on it, just on that. And so they're using this data basically to fine tune not, not just the engineering of the system or the boat that they're, it's the system actually that they're sailing on, but, to find, but also to fine tune what the crew are doing, right? And to learn what, what's going to make the boat go faster, um, learning from the different sea conditions, learning from the different wind conditions, and then putting that all together in models and then using that to help them win. And one of the things they talk about is that within the team, that every individual within that team needs their own unique dashboard so that they can sort of pull out from that dashboard an understanding of what it is that they are contributing to the project. And I think in software development as well that we need to kind of think about what kind of unique dashboards do we need to support the different people on the team. And of course the need for explainable AI comes up, but it's not just explainable AI to one person, but it's explainable AI from one kind of stakeholder to a different kind of stakeholder, right? So having them, somebody in the middle have to do that explanation. Um, and the other thing about data that they talk about is really important is supporting postmortems by the entire team. So one of the things that they do is they sit down after the race or after they've been practicing, they sit down and they play through everything they did and they look at the data and the whole team again is there and they look at what could we have done differently, what could we have done better. And in particular, they did a postmortem after this race. <laughs> Um, and actually, this wasn't even a race. This was a training uh, session. I don't know if anybody saw this in the paper in the time, but this was uh, Team Oracle for the USA. And um, the, the sail actually on this boat is not made of fabric. It's, a, it's stiff. Um, and uh, you can see the foils underneath there. Um, so they decided to push, or the, the skipper actually decided to just push it just a little bit further to see, you know, what can this boat really do? and uh, pushed it just a little bit more, and then the conditions changed, which happens in life, right? And the boat sank, and it's this amazing, I've got some links here, if you're, the, it's fascinating to read. This boat then got dragged out underneath the uh, San Francisco Golden Gate, and it was gonna be blown out to sea. Anyway, eventually they managed to get it back in. But they, they lost months, they lost thousands, and th not just millions, but they lost the time before the race to be able to train for the race because of this. But they do say if something doesn't break, it's too heavy. Um, and so they do try to push, right, what they're doing. Um, so I'll come back to that again. So another uh, analogy that I like from this article is that great ideas come from the front lines. So they don't design the technology for these boats and for these sailors that have to actually sail the boats in laboratories just, right? I mean, obviously they do a lot of the engineering work in the laboratory and they do a lot of simulations, um, but they also go out onto the boats with the sailors and they watch what they do in race time and also in training time. So they learn a lot from doing that. And I wanna push, and I know Neil is doing that with his teams, to that it's so important to observe how developers are using the AI on a day-to-day -day basis, um, not just individually, but as part of the team to understand how we can improve it more. Um, and in terms of sort of that front line thing, here's an example of something that you might, you might learn. So on my boat, we call uh, my auto helm. So my auto helm is, is just basically a mechanical thing. I set in a compass direction or I can connect it to the GPS and it steers the boat. So we don't have to steer the boat. And we call it auto. And we personify auto. And, uh, and actually this blog post talks about the same kind of thing. And when Otto screws up, we say, well, Otto's cranky today. You know, like why, why did Otto screw, it up, screw us up, right? And, but we call our GPS a GPS. And I always wondered, like, why? Why do we, you know, give a name to the, the auto helm, but everything else is just the GPS or the depth sounder? And this blog post actually shed light on this for me. So the, 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 blog, the writer of this blog post, he explains that um, on their boat, um, the auto helm, the automation that takes over the auto helm is like a crew member. So it is doing something that decides where the boat's going to go and actually affects kind of their 
their life, right? It's taking over what a, what a crew member would do. And so this is the kind of thing that you can learn when you go on the front lines that maybe, you know, some of the AI should be under the covers, right? But maybe some of the AI should be as part of a bot within the channel where there's awareness and transparency and conversation and feedback and so on happening. And then the idea that it's all about just, you know, the machine kind of, you know, or, you know, the data or engineering winning the race, it's not. At the end of the day, it does come down to people, but it comes down to people and how they're supported by the technology. So it really is this effective sort of integration. Um, this is just, you know, the skipper saying that, yeah, he made the mistake, you know, that, uh, that led to them losing one of the races. And I just want to also mention this, uh, this quote because I really like this one. I, I think some people have seen that cyclical graph, right, that shows the AI HCI. Every time there's an AI winter, HCI labs go up and then, then AI jumps again. And that rather than doing this cycle, that we need to really think about addressing both of these at the same time um, so that HCI doesn't have to come in and clean up the mess, right, that the AI uh, researchers leave behind. Okay, and I put some discussion points uh, for the panel, but uh, we can maybe come back to these later. But I do think that we need to think a lot more about how AI can enable, or an AI-enabled bots can support, or even potentially harm software team collaboration and communication. I haven't talked about the risks in this talk. I've done that in other talks, but there's lots of risks, and we've heard about lots of them at the other breakouts. Um, how can engineering system and development teams together embrace and evaluate disruptions from the AI? So on the America's Cup team, the engineering team and the sailors are one team. Um, and I think that in development, we could think about that a lot more as well, have a lot more closer collaboration between engineering team and the, en the developers themselves. And I didn't talk a lot about dashboards, but I do think that this is an interesting future piece of work, how these um, dashboards, these AI-infused dashboards, could support tactical decision-making, support operations, and also post-mortems, and how they could be personalized, and how we could study them. And by the way, I do think we could use bots to study right, some of these things as well. So I pass it to you. I don't know how long I rabbit Thanks, it on Peggy. for. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. So while I set up uh, Prem's going next, um, Prem's slides, if anybody any has questions for Peggy, um, please, any questions, comments? Yeah, that's that's very much a work in progress, and it's a, super interesting it's a really interesting question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think right now the way that bots are being used um, and being designed, it's very ad hoc. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it's kind of like, here's an idea for a bot. Let's let's write one and let's deploy it and then see see how it sticks and see how it's being used. Yeah. And I think it could be useful to take more of a an engineering or architecture or system perspective yeah. on the bots and understand where they play and really think about should this be a bot you know that is conversation enabled or should it just be yeah. you know a command and, and i think i'm kind of thinking in api terms it's when when would this thing want to interact like another human with this exactly. yeah, yeah. And that, that's yeah. the really interesting yeah. things yeah. yeah really super interesting yeah, yeah. thank you Okay, um, so uh, thanks for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be here and talk about this area. So this has kind of taken over my life for the past eight years or so. Um, is there a remote? Oh, here it is, okay. Uh, so let me just explain what this term naturalist means. There's, there's some confusion about w uh, this particular term. So, you know, so the way I like to explain it is that like human speech and writing have evolved, you know, over thousands of years uh, to, to serve certain natural human purposes. Um, and the kind of structure and use of these human languages, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about where they come from, but what we've discovered is that the same kinds of structures and patterns of usage also exist in code. Um, so uh, now, what does that mean, right? So when you think about natural language, you know, a good example is this guy here who's about to have a very bad day. Um, and, you know, let's say his children are on the side of the pool, and so how is he going to react to this, right? So is he going to 
sit up and recite some, uh, think of some glorious poem and recite it, or is he just simply going to say, you know, get out of here, right? Um, um, so, so this is kind of the imperative under which natural languages evolved. They've evolved to communicate uh, very efficiently and quickly in noisy, dangerous, and distracted environments. Now, what does this have to do with code? Uh, now, this fellow here, let's assume that for a moment that he's actually a developer, and that person is actually his, his manager, right? <laughs> um, so is this, is, is this chap now going to go off and think of glorious continuations and monads and recursive this is and that's, or is he just going to write the loop that he wants to write, the simplest and most mundane way he can think of, right? So a lot of coding gets done under these circumstances. And it's not just simply the coding, as, as you'll see later, it's when people think about what kind of code they want to write, it's not just themselves they're thinking of, right? Um, that also uh, relates to natural language, because when I'm speaking, I'm not just simply thinking about myself and how I want to construct my utterances. I'm also thinking about the listener and how they're going to react to my utterances. So in that sense, speaking is a very cooperative act uh, because and a very conscious and mutually conscious act, and so is coding. So, so essentially what natural means here is that human utterances and human speech are constructed in noisy, dangerous, and distracted environments. And as a result, the way we speak is highly repetitive, very predictable, and can be modeled statistically. Right? And this is wonderful because this is what enables things like Google Translate, speech recognition, uh, other forms of tools that have made all these wonderful advances in natural language processing. So code is a little bit different, right? So code is primarily intended to run on machines. So uh, when our programmer here is writing code, the sort of, in some sense, the end intent of it that it actually executes on a machine. Machines don't really care how you write it. It doesn't matter whether you write i less than 10 or 10 bigger than i or i plus 1 or 1 plus i. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and she can, has a lot of flexibility in how she chooses to write her code. So, so far, not much call for naturalness, right? Uh, but in fact, the code is actually maintained by another developer. And when the coder writes code, she's thinking about who is going to maintain the code and how the maintainer is going to read the code. And in fact, when the maintainer reads the code, it's really a noisy channel, right? So maintainers are not computers. Maintainers don't do operational semantics or denotational semantics in their head. They're actually genuinely reading in a noisy channel environment. So by this I mean actually mean the Shannon noisy channel, right? So when a developer reads code, she's thinking to herself, this is probably the computation that the developer intended to write, the maintainer hypothesizes. And then the maintainer says, if the developer were meaning to implement this computation, what's the most likely way that she would have implemented it? So I'm really sort of recapturing the Bayesian formulation of the noisy channel model, right? So she's going to guess how would she have implemented this. And she's going to look for those bits in the code. And if those bits are not there, she's going to say, well, she must have done, been doing something else. She's going to hypothesize a different um, imp uh, computation that the developer may have intended, and she's going to see how, think about how that would have been implemented. So it really is the noisy channel, right? You're not computing semantics directly from the program using an operational channel. You're guessing meanings. That's how people read code. Anyway, I, I can't prove this, but this is just my hypothesis, right? So this formulation uh, is called, we call it the DEU model because it came out of a discussion between people at UC Davis and Edinburgh and UCL. So uh, Charles Sutton at Edinburgh and uh, Earl Barr at UCL. So we don't have quite have a name for this formulation. Various times we call it bimodal comprehension. Sometimes we call it um, two-channel comprehension. We're not sure yet. But the cool thing is that this, the second channel here is really actually a noisy channel. And there's a lot of interesting questions that come up out of this. So um, right. OK, so because of this noisy channel uh, that exists in code, and because it's not formal uh, operational semantics based, software as it is used is repetitive, predictable, and amenable to statistical modeling, because the same imperatives that apply to the construction of natural language utterances apply to the construction of code. OK, all right, so, so what, right? So, um, so what, it's taken over the last eight years of my life. <laughs> right? And there are two aspects to this. Um, the first aspect, which I'm not going to say a lot about because I got the sense that really I should talk more about the engineering 
aspects of this um, in this forum. Uh, but this is, I spend more than half my life these days on the scientific aspects of this. And we do a lot of human subject studies. We're doing a lot of corpus studies. Um, uh, and maybe even done some eye tracking studies. Um, so how does code relate to human preference and, and performance, right? So uh, you know, people never say bread and butter for uh, butter and bread, for example, they always say bread and butter, right? Nobody ever writes I equals one plus I, right? So those things are actually related and relates to the noisy channel, right? You expect certain computations to be written certain ways, and if you write it a different way, it actually impedes comprehension um, and impedes, uh, imp impedes smooth, easy reading of code. So we're doing a lot of human subject studies in this area. We just finished a, um, a mechanical Turk study with 70 participants trying to figure out if we can predict which forms of writing code would be preferred by human beings, and, be, and we can. Um, the, and the next step is for us is to do um, to determine to, with what accuracy we can prefer how people would prefer to see code being written. And then after that, we're going to do some code comprehension studies to see if we can predict which code is going to be easier for human beings to understand and which kind of code is going to be harder for human beings to read. And this work is being done in collaboration with Emily Morgan, who is um, a psycholinguist at, at UC Davis. And so this is very exciting for us because she's generally been studying forms of expression in natural language uh, using a theory called Rational Speech Act Theory. And we're now trying to apply that same theory to, to code. Uh, but that's all I'm going to say about it. I'm happy to discuss it more if anybody's interested uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the panel discussion. All right, so the other part of my life is uh, trying to explore the engineering question, how do you ex ex exploit code repetitiveness to help programmers? So the first paper on this was written about eight years ago um, uh, in our group, and uh, you know, so we exploited some uh, interesting properties to do some applications. So I'll talk more about the applications for, for the rest of, of this talk. Okay, so you know the basic general scheme is, you know, as Neil mentioned, is that you know this is sort of the way people used to build tools. Um, you think of a tool, and the developer decides, okay, I need this tool, so she goes off and writes a tool, and then the tool can process source code and produce results. So a lot of you know tools fit into this framework, right? So the twist here is that because now we have this property of naturalness, you can take a large code corpus, estimate various kinds of statistical models, and the statistical models can then improve the performance of the tool. So this is sort of the framework for a lot of the tools, and the, you know, the details depend upon the model you want to build, the data you have, and how the model improves the performance of the tool. OK, so you know, there's lots of uh, applications. The first application that we did in, back in 2011 was code suggestion. Um, I know, and that's basically you estimate a model like that. Um, and there are various ways to do models. Uh, we've kind of switched over to completely using um, you know, neural network-based models these days, but you know, uh, there's lots of ways to estimate these models. Um, and you know, obviously, there's lots of data. Uh, there's quite a few papers that um, uh, that have described this. Uh, we have something on uh, GitHub you can welcome to use. It's called SLP Core. A lot of people are using it. Um, it's until very recently some very recent work from. Um, uh, from, um, uh, from, from Edinburgh, this was, our model was the best performing model. Um, uh, so, uh, so one very interesting problem in code that doesn't occur in natural language is vocabulary explosion. So in natural language, um, as you scan more and more tests, the vocabulary starts to grow slower and slower, and eventually it saturates. It's only like place names and people names that begin to grow. But every new module of code introduces new vocabulary, so there's a real problem in vocabulary. And if, until very recently, deep learning models were terrible at it. Uh, you, you have to cap the vocabulary, or essentially the number of parameters you have to train is, is, becomes unmanageable. Um, the recent work from, uh, from Karam Patsits and Sutton show how to deal with uh, vocabulary explosion in deep learning models using something called byte pair encoding, which is a way of splitting up identifiers um, and, and doing this quite efficiently. Um, so this is kind of, I guess, the, the sort of the first uh, application that has been, uh, was done. And it was great to see uh, it being used now and sh shipped and actually apparently being used by millions of users. I saw a demo uh, in, uh, of IntelliSense, and it was, it was great to see that. Um, the other big thing that has come up in a lot is JavaScript deobfuscation. It's, I put deobfuscation in quotes because it's not really deobfuscation. It's basically uh, replacing 
you know, dumb names with better names. So, you know, a lot of people minify Java code when it ships out and you can recover the names from it. And so this is basically estimating a, a model of this sort, you know, estimating clear code using minified code. By the way, all these models, you know, this one and that one need data for estimation. And, you know, in all these things, you have huge amounts of data. It's not really a problem. You know, once you have a tool that does minification, you, can, you know, you can produce as much data as you want uh, to do this task. Um, and, you know, again, there are various kinds of models. Um, the first one in the, along these lines was um, a, a model based on conditional random fields from uh, Rechev et al. at ETH. We've done some work along these lines using phrase-based translation uh, that works in a complementary way to the CRF work from Rechev et al. So actually, if you put the two together, you get much better performance. Um, the same technology is now being used for recovering identifier names from binaries uh, in decompiled binaries. Um, so it's, it's a pretty useful thing. The other kind of exciting application is gradual typing. Uh, so gradual typing is a framework where developers, it's sort of a compromise between uh, Java-like languages where everything has to be declared and Python-like languages where nothing has to be declared. This is a way where you add declarations um, uh, to suit yourself, to sort of like look for errors in places where you think that you might make typing errors. Um, so this estimates a model of this type, um, uh, estimate the type, uh, you know, the dis this distribution, uh, the type given the name and the context. Um, so a lot of people have used context more recently uh, this year. There's some work on using the name of the variable to estimate uh, this distribution. Um, there's a bunch of work in this area. We've done work on this. Uh, uh, so there's been work from ETH and Michael Prattel. Um, uh, has now a Stuttgart has also done work in this area. So these are some of the uh, emerging early applications of this, the first applications. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of work to be done uh, along these lines. So um, so this is sort of a, the simplest model you can think of, and it turns out this is actually quite useful, um, and that's for checking code, right? So um, so you can just simply estimate a model over a large corpus, and if the model says the code is weird, it turns out this actually you know, quite, quite accurate in finding, um, finding defects. So this was a paper in XC 2016. Um, and it, oddly enough, I mean, it's not a fair comparison, uh, but oddly enough, this is about as good as many uh, things like find bugs. Um, of course, find bugs tells you what you think is wrong. This doesn't tell you anything except saying this looks weird, right? So, um, so, so this is kind of the simplest possible thing, but it turns out you know, it already is uh, arguably useful. So this was the suggestion thing that I talked about earlier. Um, variable name recovery, this can be used to, um, you know, again, you can estimate this with any large corpus, um, and so you can use this to either recover names as in the context of uh, uh, deobfuscation, or you can use it to check whether you're using an improper variable name. Um, uh, so this is the, the gradual typing problem, um, and you know again uh, I talked about this, and it sort of again can be trained from large amounts of data. Um, so so far these are sort of what you know what Neil was talking about is with this inner circle stuff. There's also kind of more outer circle stuff that relates more to like not immediate coding but more sort of process oriented things. Um, so uh, interestingly, there's lots of data on these lines, and there's been a number of papers coming out recently that allow you to 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 repair code. Um, so, um, so there's been a few different experiments uh, using some standard data sets to see how well uh, machine learning models can patch code. Uh, most of the existing work on automatic code patching has been using genetic approaches. In other words, you sort of have a hill climbing search, searching over a lot of possible patches, trying to find something that can actually patch your defect. The new approaches involve no search, uh, or very little search, um, so they're much more efficient. It's basically um, you train a translation model using large amounts of data from GitHub uh, that uh, talk about how, um, you know, typically the data sets use one line patches, and they train a translator to translate from old code to new code using sequence to sequence models or trans, uh, transformer models. So there's, most of the recent work is now, we, we have any, anyway, most of our work now has been using transformers. Um, and um, they are uh, not as powerful and successful as the genetic approaches, but they're much quicker. Um, so, um, so this is kind of interesting um, uh, stuff to do. Um, so the data can be trained using commit data. You can also simply do um, you know, things like uh, denoising autoencoding, 
uh, and so on and so forth. And we've done some experiments with large data sets of student programs, and denoising autoencoders can correct about 50 to 60% of student errors. Um, so that's, uh, those, those are syntax errors. Um, um, so this is another kind of interesting area of, of, of research. Um, then th this is, th 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 so this is essentially producing English from code. Um, and there's some interesting issues here that, that are, that are uh, going on, right? So um, there's, th there's useful comments and there's useless comments, right? So, so there's, for an, the kind of comments that are needed by somebody who is unfamiliar with the code is one thing. The kind of comments that are def needed by code, people who are familiar with the code is something else altogether. So in other words, you know, if the code is written the way you expect it to be written, right, then this comment is sort of most useful to people who are unfamiliar with it. But sometimes the code is not written the way you expect it, and then you really need comments to explain what the code is doing. So in other words, there's summarization and there's commenting. They're two different things. Um, and so Charles Sutton has some very interesting work where he tries to say, if the English is predictable from the code, if the comment is predictable from the code, then it's actually probably a useless comment for most people, right? So, so there's some interesting stuff going on here, and we don't uh, quite know how to classify the two kinds of comments. The comment that is really a literal add one to i, who cares, right? Um, whereas something more complex like, you know, resync the lock or something like that, which is not what you expect i equals i plus one to be doing, right? So, um, so that's an interesting question. Um, then this code retrieval, I mean, I, you know, now we're really far away from sort of the singularity of all this. This is mostly about like, you know, uh, for example, using Stack Overflow data so that you give some English description and you can find the code. Um, there's some very interesting problems here. We've just finished uh, a, uh, um, a, uh, a, a code snippet parser and typer, so we can type and parse code snippets. Uh, with very high accuracy um, so that you can take fragments from Stack Overflow and you know what type the bits are and you know what syntax it is. So we can do it with well over 95% accuracy. Um, so and so you, ne you need that because if you're trying to paste some code from Stack Overflow, retrieve some, some code and paste it, you need to be able to parse it and type it. And then finally, uh, you know, we're given some code to recommend a person, and this is uh, for various kinds of task assignment. Um, so this is very interesting. We've, we've now managed to train language models specific to individual pro developers in a project. So um, you take, take a general language model uh, trained over a large code corpus, you know, and then specialize that model for each developer. So given a code fragment, we can score each developer um, so that we know you know, how familiar that developer is with that code fragment. Um, and this, you know, we haven't, you know, we welcome collaboration on this. Um, so we're trying to apply to recommend uh, code reviewers, but I think there's lots of other potential applications. Let's say, for example, you get a warning on a piece of code, um, and, uh, you know, you don't necessarily want to go ask the person who implemented the code or the person who last changed the code to comment on it, because that person may have committed to that module but they may not have touched that module in a long time. So what you'd like to know is who has written code like this? And language models are pretty good at spotting that. So we welcome partners on this because it's, it's kind of hard to do that particular experiment whether you're recommending the right person to fix a warning uh, using open source code. So you know, if anybody's interested in it, we'd be happy to work with you on this. Um, so, so this is just some examples. There's a lot more stuff. We're doing some stuff with recommend, uh, f to determine validity of invariance. Um, uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities. So anyway, these are all different types of probabilistic, uh, probabilistic uh, models. Um, you know, how exactly you approximate these probabilities from data sets, you know, there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, so there's many different models, you know, so there's, you know, discrete traditional models in gram variance, there's uh, tree-based models like PCFG and TSGs. Um, uh, probabilistic context-free grammars and uh, 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 tree-structured tree grammars. Um, there are phrase-based translation models that, that, are, that have been used. Uh, there's conditional random fields. Um, and of course, you know, now uh, a lot of uh, attention is being paid to these deep learning models, um, uh, lexical models, sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, 
sequence tagging models. So as the difference between these two is a sequence tagging model, the input and output length is identical. Uh, so for in part of speech tagging, for instance, or when you want to assign types to variables, you want to guess types of variables, uh, the inputs and outputs sizes are equivalent. So uh, th these models generally tend to perform better because the, the length is conserved anyway. Um, transformers are becoming uh, uh, very powerful, uh, and uh, uh, we've, we've had a lot of success with them. Um, uh, we hope to have some papers coming out soon uh, with them. They're very easy to train. They're very efficient. They have enormous capacity. Um, so uh, it's pretty promising, uh, and gated graph neural network. So these models are uh, very promising and powerful, but they're very slow. So um, there's some recent work at Google where they have managed to speed these things quite a bit using data structure layouts. Um, and we're also doing some experiments trying to find ways to speed up the training of gated graph networks. So it's, there's lots of ways to approximate these functions that, that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, um, and, uh, and you know, it's all about finding enough data to train it. Um, so there are various issues that this, I'm gonna stop with this slide. This is, um, uh, this is some of the issues that, that are faced in CORD. Um, so one big problem in CORD is vocabulary proliferation. Um, the BP seems very promising and we're getting good results with that as well. We've been able to replicate the results um, from, uh, from Sakna and Karampatsas, even in some cases improve on it. Um, so maybe that is the solution, I don't know. Um, another big problem is explainability. So, um, so I actually learned a few things at this, uh, at this faculty seminar that I'm really eager to go back and try. Um, so you know, when you suggest a patch to a programmer, you suggest a type for, you know, to, in a gradual typing environment, or um, you suggest a change or something along these lines or just, just give a normal code suggestion, it'd be nice to have some explanations of why you're doing that, especially with patching um, and also with like um, saying this code looks bad, you should fix it. It'd be nice to have some examples. And I think there are ways to deal with this, but I think this is a really exciting and interesting open area. Um, and finally, um, so I think that sort of in some sense the most exciting thing about code is the fact that it has both operational semantics and noisy channel going on, right? So you're writing code for the computer and you're writing code to actually, uh, to, to actually be read by a human being. And so there's a probabilistic side to code and then there's a deterministic formal side to code. So how do you exploit these two things together? I think some of the most exciting work in this area is going to come out of that. So I'll stop there. Questions? Have I gone over or? Uh, yeah, we, we're going to Sorry. And, uh, Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Um, thank you. So the last speaker, yes, um, yes. Hassan, hopefully you can stay for a few minutes longer so that we can get through the talk. Uh, Hamad had some really interesting things to say related to data and some of the work he did uh, with I the companies he worked with. Yeah. Um, is that correct? Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you, thanks. We'll so probably run into break at least five minutes, so hopefully you can stay for that. So I'm going I'm to try to do this talk in uh, two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, basically, so this is my lab. We are the software analysis intelligence lab, and what I want to do today is I want to talk about primarily our experience of actually having machine learning models that actually software developers have been using. So some of these are systems, actually, now what I was thinking about have been used for the last 10 years, or actually a decade of systems that are using machine learning on software engineering data, and kind of our experience and more how developers have actually found them. Now, quick overview. So software developers produce quite a bit of data, so things like code changes, release notes, bug reports, email discussion, code reviews. We call these development repositories, but as well, users as well produce a lot of data. So things like crashes, logs, telemetries, reviews. Okay, we call these field repositories, okay? Another type of data as well that people use, so online code, Stack Overflow, GitHub. So all that information today, unfortunately, is only one way, right? The data doesn't go back in your next decision-making process. The simplest thing is think of Amazon, how Amazon tells you when you buy A, you buy B. You could do that same thing for software developers. When you change A, you ch people, whenever people change A, they change B. So now this is an area that kind of been going for many years, it's called basically the mining software repositories community. So the mining software repository community now has been around 20 years. It's actually considered one of the top 10 venues by, by Google Scholar for Systems Research, okay? So um, there's many, many people that have been doing stuff on this. I'm just giving you a, a flavor that's influenced kind of about what I'm doing. 
But if you're interested in this, so be, do check this community. Okay, so as I said, so many companies that actually use this today in practice, so these are some of them. Okay, now, really at the end of it is there's data, there's a model, and what we care about is two things. So we care about a decision and we care about insight. Now the decision is kind of like you want to say, okay, is this piece of code buggy or not? Okay, so that's binary. But actually for developers, when we talk to managers, they don't care as much about this one, they care about how to improve the process in the future, right? So that's actually where the insight comes in, right? For them, the insight is more important for them actually than the decision for this bug, because that will only fix this specific one, right? So now I'm gonna give you some flavors of that. So uh, ideally what you want is when a new code change comes in, you wanna be able to flag it, right? So red, yellow, green. So red means there is something really bad about this code change. Yellow, you know, this looks a bit kind of worrisome, guys. Green is go ahead, commit that, okay? Now, uh, we were lucky actually that we worked with BlackBerry on this project, and what they had is they had for their developers for every code change, so this was done on the device software for the Blackberries. They would actually rank manually the change, whether it's high risk or low risk. Okay. Now I want to emphasize something, which is in, we learned is for them, they didn't care about buggy or not buggy. They actually cared about risk, which means much bigger influence than just buggy or not buggy. For example, a change might be super simple. You updated the UI, but for some reason that change is touching a piece of code or required the whole code base to be recertified by actually the the carriers, so it would push the whole release by a couple of months. It's a very simple change, but it's a high risk change. So now the idea is we have all these changes here, we have risk classifications, so wouldn't it be nice that actually we would learn from this, build a model, so now when a new change comes in, we can actually predict that, right? So, and that's exactly what we did. So we took one year of changes, okay? And we actually would pass them through the human developers, and we'd pass them through the model, and then we actually get this is the risk that actually the developers did, that the system did, this is the risk that actually the developers did, and it's 0.84 correlation. Correlations go from zero to one. Zero means it's random, one means it's perfect. So actually we got a good correlation here. Now this was actually a study where we, the, the, the student was there for a year. So we actually he looked at around 450 developers doing that across 60 teams. Now an interesting thing we learned out of this is Actually, what they did when they started using it, they didn't, only, they didn't only depend on the automated system, they actually depended on both of them. So they treated both of them as different experts. So if the developer says this is high risk, and then the, our system says low risk, it will still be high risk. And the other way around, if we say it's low risk, developer says it's high risk, right? So this is an example where it's not always about, you know, the system is right and you want to replace it, it's more to support the human. Now, this type of work has actually been Kind of, there's an open source project called commit.guru where you can actually go in and actually upload your, it would analyze your code base and it would give you that type of analysis. Now a lot of companies as well have adopted this, so Ubisoft does that, and many other companies now actually have developed this in-house. Now this is the, in, Ubisoft is done independent from my team and many other companies have done that. Okay, now another, so this is how I call, I guess, the inner loop. Now, when you talk about the uh, outer loop is I'm gonna look at actually at uh, testing and very large scale testing. So think of Amazon. They don't only wanna make sure that one user can buy a book, they wanna make sure that a million people can buy a book and nothing could go wrong. Now, the problem today is a lot of these tests, the way they're verified that they pass is, did anything crash? If nothing crashed, we're good, right? Well, that's probably not the best way to go about it. So we wanted to actually leverage some of the data that's produced from these tests. Okay, so simple thing is you have a sequence of events, like let's say, so logs in this case, so we do a lot of log analytics. And you know, so we have event two, so acquiring a log is followed by releasing a log. So really what happens is we do this. So we look at actually what's happening in the test, and we, because it's a test, we expect to be very repetitive. So if we see any deviations from the repetitiveness, we can actually flag it. Now the beauty of this is we actually, we and actually most developers don't exactly know how the system runs at scale. But by actually at recovering that information with the logs, we can actually flag, look that this E6 happened and it shouldn't happen. Okay, so now what really happens is you actually, the output out of this is something like this. So it says, this log message here. So this D Dell DVD store is an is a application used by Dell to actually benchmark their servers. So, and, so it's basically like a DVD store, so you're entering a purchase, so 98% of the time, 
this message is followed by this long message is followed by this long message. 1% of the time, this long message is followed by this message. And you know, 358 times this sequence is followed. And then what happens is actually all these sequences are sorted, right? So the highest one here, like this one here, the one I expanded, actually shows you the most weirdest kind of sequence that we have seen. So then what happens is the tester now can copy and paste this, this HTML kind of document and email to the developer and ask them, okay, what's happening in here? Good, so this arrived, you know, 99.9% reduction in the view log files, okay, and the precision is quite high, you know, 56 to 100%. Now what was nice about this is we actually give them as well an example of exactly like that sequence and what went wrong in there. Now you could take that same log sequencing and you can start adding time on it. Okay, so we know event, what, event A, B, C, D happened together. Now we can say, you know, it took this sequence like five seconds. Okay, now we've seen that so many times, so now we can create a distribution. Okay, so the, on the black here, on the black, so on the left side is one actually run, and on the right side is another run. If you can see on, because of the red here, it is actually a bit slower, this run compared to the other one, okay? And then here we'll actually laser it over time again. So, and here what it's saying is, you know, we wanna make sure maybe, because what could happen is over time, the system might be getting bad, right? Or in this case, it's always bad here, okay? Okay, so this was an example actually of, in MySQL, there was a bug in MySQL, so this actually eventually got fixed, okay? So these are some examples of actually how we have used this data. Some of these systems have actually been used, as I said, for the last 10 years. Okay? So the question is, what's the secret for long-term industrial adoption? So is it highly scalable, top-performing models? And the answer is actually not really the case. And I'm gonna spend the next slide, which is actually the last slide, to explain at least my thought about really what makes some of these things work. Okay? One of the things that's special about we have is we have basically we have a human in the loop. A lot of the decisions we give them is now this person has to go to somebody up in management to say, for example, we're not gonna release this system. We're not gonna do this release. Now it's very hard to go, I cannot do this release because this deep learner is saying no, right? So they really need to be, have something that supports their decision because the manager will say, get out of my room, okay? So this is kind of one of the biggest challenges here is how do you make that? Now, there are two things. So what I would say are domain challenges and some of them are actually machine learning challenges. And I'm gonna go through them kinda one at a time. So one of the tricks I think we found is it's really important that the decision or whatever the machine learning system gives you is assignable to somebody. So an example for that is in, this bug, in, the, in the system that would actually say, look, this is a buggy change. What was good about that is two things, is we actually were able to, we had a specific person, which is this, the developer that did the change where we could say, this is your problem, deal with it which was very different than prior work in the area, which prior work in the area said, okay, before the release, analyze all your code changes and flag buggy files and non-buggy files. The question is, okay, so you know this file is super buggy, so who do you give it to, right? Whereas this one, it's your problem, deal with your hot potato, okay? So that was one thing. The other thing, too, is timely. So again, I'm gonna use that example just for time, but the, it applies for the other ones, too, is, we did it right there, you ha because it happened inside the IDE, like you had the files open, you could deal with it now, right? But when you say, look, this file that had 50 people that worked in it, some of them worked there like a couple months ago, is troublesome, it was much harder to do that. Now machine learning challenge, so explainable is a key thing, and the reason we want the models to be explainable is a lot of the developers and managers don't only care about this release, they care about the long term. You know, if there's something we're doing bad, we wanna be able to flag it and improve our processes. And this is what the explainability was a key thing. Now another one that actually I've recently started to realize is this idea of trust. So let's say you have, you, you have a lot of data, raw data, okay? And over the years, developers are smart and they've actually developed their own scripts and their own, I would say, non-AI models, just some warning signals that they know about. So they have a script that runs over all the raw data, and if that script says something is bad, they, they trust that system, right? So now you have two ways. You can go the, the deep learning idea, which is just take all the raw data, okay? Or you can go the simple way. Let's take their, what I would say, trustable, dumb models, 
Which one would you go with, right? So intuitively you say, well, let's take all the raw data, get the human out of the loop. But instead, actually, it is much more easier to get the system adopted, at least in our experience, where you say, look, this is based on a combination of all your basic models. You trusted all of these, and we just built on top of your trust. So that was one essential thing. Okay, and the other thing is this maintainability aspect. Um, in a lot of corporations, the, the machine learning team, there's like one or two big teams, and these teams have to go from different, you know, to help a group, and then they need to go out, like more of a consulting setup, right? So the idea is your models, you wanna be able to set them up, leave, not every two days get a phone call, hey, can you come and help us tweak the parameters, right? So this is an essential part as well, okay? So that's kind of like my big views on like really what I felt kind of worked and why some of these systems have been used for many years. Like, you know, this is, system has been used for almost 10 years now when I think about it, and we are never really called in to tweak the models on there, right? Okay, so with that in mind, this is kind of basically what I talked about today. So I talked, I introduced about this idea of the mining software repository community and how there's so much data today and you can actually look at that data and produce it and reuse it to actually make your Next decision, I'll give you an example of kind of how you could use the data about prior changes to actually detect whether a change is high risk or low risk. I'll give you another example as well how to use logs, so that outer loop aspect to actually detect performance problems in a system by actually mining these logs which are rarely ever used. And then I walk through very rapidly of some of the reasons why I think it's more essential to focus on these over just blindly the performance of the model itself. Okay, so that's it in, what is that, in 10 you're, minutes. You're five minutes before the <laughs> keynote. I apologize.